Hello, this presentation is about the anatomy, histophysiology, and pathophysiology of COVID-19. Uh, this is part of a group of presentations for the post-acute COVID-19 exercise and rehabilitation, the PACER project. My name is Steve Tepper. I'm the president of Rehab Essentials, an online uh, therapy education uh, company. Um, I have the great privilege of working with Drs. El um, Ellen Rubel and Dr. Eric Stewart, uh, both from University of Delaware. I can't tell you how much I appreciate working with them. Just a little background, um, my PhD is actually in uh, pathology, and so I'm pretty well versed in this information, but please, this is just a primer in a lot of ways for what is going on. The disclosures, the author group has no disclosures to make in regards to this. Disclaimer, this course is intended for educational purposes and does not replace mentorship or consultation with more experienced cardiopulmonary or acute care colleagues. Content is current at the time of dissemination. However, the evidence and science of COVID-19 is evolving rapidly right in front of our eyes and the information is certainly subject to change. The description of this course is this module will allow therapists to understand how the novel coronavirus creates the sequelae and most characteristics of COVID-19. Through a review of basic lung histology, lung heart function, and the pathophysiology of this infection, the mechanisms by which coronavirus causes pneumonia, and in some cases, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, will be highlighted along with the recovery process. The objectives. At the conclusion of this module, the therapist will be able to explain normal anatomy, physiology, histology of the heart and lungs, and I've underlined histology of the lungs because really that is going to be the critical piece that we're going to be dealing with COVID-19 and their interrelationship between the heart and lungs. Pathophysiology related to the coronavirus and COVID-19 presentation with a focus on acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS and the means of disease transmission of the novel coronavirus and common comorbidities associated with COVID-19 related to hospitalizations. The novel coronavirus, the root of this crisis, and I like the root off to the right that Dr. Rubel added, is that this is a new virus to the human population asymptomatic presentation of some individuals despite being infected is probably the biggest issue that is going around or is the problem with this at this moment. Also, there's inadequate confirmatory testing going on at this point and it is highly contagious. And what I mean by that, it doesn't have to be large droplets from sneezing or coughing. It can literally be in within the spoken word that again, this virus can be transmitted from one person to the next. In regards to masks, I do wanna point this out. Whenever you go out into the public, you should be wearing some type of covering over your mouth so that when you are speaking to people, even though you might be asymptomatic, you can't transfer the virus to them. So the reason you wear a mask in public is to protect others. It is not so much to protect you. But when you're in the clinic and wearing an N95 mask, that is designed to keep the virus from getting into your nasal and oral and lung area. There is a lag in medical therapies and prophylaxis until the genomics of the virus are better understood and there is actually randomized controlled trials of testing of these medications. It is essential that you realize that you might be hearing about what people are taking to, again, mitigate this, but at this point right now, they are not well-controlled studies. All eyes are on the lungs. Why is this? Well, 
The reason for that is I'll defer the explanation of the other ICU and virus related complications that are appropriately require rehabilitation to other modules, but I'm going to focus on the lungs because that's the thing that is going to lead to death primarily in individuals that have this infection. Excellent resources. Please, these are two wonderful resources that you can get. Again, uh, one on the bottom was distributed to all people that are part of the cardiovascular and pulmonary section, and I imagine it went out to the acute care section as well. The one at the top is just a beautiful also article. Even though it was updated in March 2020, it really has the major constituents of what you're going to see in this presentation. So going about you know, the lungs, um, the respiratory anatomy and transport. You know, you got to think about the lungs. There's passageways like the trachea, the main stem bronchi, the lo lo lobular bronchi, segmental bron bronchi, subsegmental bronchi, and eventually into lobular bronchioles. And so a lobular bronchiole is shown right here, and that's what you're seeing in this picture. Eventually, it goes down to respiratory bronchioles and to alveoli. But in this figure, what I also would like to point out is you can see right here a branch of the pulmonary artery, and you can see a branch of the pulmonary vein. So just want to make sure you can see these different structures because you want to be thinking about what the lungs do is allow air and the oxygen within it to meet up with blood so that the blood can get oxygenated. I'm going to focus on oxygen, but obviously CO2 transport could be affected as well. One other thing that you notice down here, you can also see the pleura and the visceral lining, which is attached to the lungs, versus the parietal lining that helps to hold the lungs open under normal circumstances. But notice that last box that I put there, that's what we're going to zoom in on because that's the alveoli. So what I did is I modified this figure that you're looking off and seeing over here on the right, and that's just showing you a nice normal alveolus. This is the portion where oxygen is going to go through the type 1 pneumocytes, which are those thin, flattened cells that you see in the alveolus. The more cuboidal cells that you see in the alveolus are called type 2 pneumocytes, and the type 2 pneumocytes produce surfactant. Surfactant helps to keep alveoli open because surfactant is a negatively charged molecule. When the alveolus gets smaller and smaller, negative repels negative, and it helps to keep the alveoli open. Along with this figure, the other thing that you see is a nice capillary going by. So you'd have from the pulmonary artery deoxygenated blood coming into this capillary, but then as it goes through the alveolus, it does get oxygenated. So if you were to take a look at the actual structure itself, and again, most of you did get to dissect the lungs, and the lungs were like these huge sponges. Well, the reason they're just like these huge sponges is because of all these billions of tiny air sacs. So what you're looking at right here is where it's labeled AD, that's alveolar ducts, leading to these small circular, again, structure called alveoli. And if I zoom in on this one alveoli right here in the center, it'll look like this. Here is an alveoli. You can see it, again, uh, alveolar sacs up there. On the bottom right, you can really see that's just a single alveoli inside of there. And what you notice is, is in the middle of that alveoli, you have alveolar phagocytic cells, or what are called alveolar macrophages. Those are designed to, again, if a, something foreign gets into your lungs, 
This is designed to engulf it and hopefully remove it from, again, causing a nice pneumonia. You can also see there, there's an intraalveolar pore, which again is labeled IP, and that just connects one alveoli to another. So a critical thinking question at this juncture, over on the left-hand side, in this scanning electron micrograph, what you're looking at is you notice the erythrocyte right there. So that's a red blood cell inside of the capillary, which means you're looking through the type 1 pneumocyte, which is the thin epithelial cell of the alveolus. You're looking through the endothelial cell of the capillary, and you're seeing these donut-shaped objects, which are the erythrocytes, which again are the red blood cells. So air moves into this area, and what's important then is oxygen moves from the air onto the awaiting hemoglobin. Now the question that's posed here is, how might a pathology since pneumonia interfere with the gas exchange and ultimately impact oxygen delivery? What you need to keep in mind is what pneumonia is, is an infection in this area causing inflammatory cells, causing plasma proteins to leak out, causing fluid to leak out into this area. And as it leaks into this area, that fluid and infiltrate moving in here will keep oxygen from again attaching to these red blood cells and the hemoglobin. So basic respiratory physiology, ventilation, which is called V, transport the gases, respiratory gases, between the environment, the air we breathe, and the alveoli. Diffusion is the exchange of those gases at the alveolar level. Again, oxygen moves in, CO2 moves out. Perfusion, which is called Q by vis physiologists. And so for those of you that work in acute care hospitals, you know they call it a VQ scan, but that stands for a ventilation perfusion scan. Physiologists do like to confuse some things sometimes. But perfusion is the pulmonary circulation, that transport of, again, blood through the lungs so that, again, what can happen is, is that deoxygenated pulmonary arterial flow, which is shown over here on the right in a bluish color, will go by the alveoli, pick up the oxygen onto the hemoglobin, and come out in the pulmonary venous blood as nice oxygenated blood. That oxygenated blood goes to the left side of the heart, and what's important about that is that oxygenated blood goes out to the tissues of our body and allows peripheral gas exchange, the exchange of oxygen going to the tissues of our body, and CO2 coming from the tissues as part of aerobic metabolism. So I always like this diagram right here. Dr. Wasserman drew this years and years and years ago, but to me, it just puts it into such a wonderful way. So I'm gonna start out by explaining this. Your lungs are a pump. You inhale, you exhale. So if you think about the lungs as a pump, the amount of air that you bring in and out with a normal breath is tidal volume or TV. RR stands for respiratory rate. So if we know that somebody is breathing 12 breaths per minute times a half liter tidal volume, which is normal, 12 times a half liter means minute ventilation. It's about six liters of air comes into your lungs and six liters of air goes out of your lungs. <clears throat> the heart is a pump. It doesn't pump air, it pumps blood. So now we deal with something, instead of minute ventilation, we talk about cardiac output. Instead of tidal volume, we got stroke volume. And stroke volume is the amount of blood squeezed out per beat. So under normal circumstances, that's around 70 milliliters. And if your heart rate is 72 beats per minute, 
70 times 72 roughly equals about 5,000 or five liters of blood is what is coming into the heart, venous return, which equals cardiac output, the amount of blood coming out of the heart. And finally, when we get all the way down to muscle tissue, we think about what is occurring at muscle tissue, and that's going to be your aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. What I want to do is also focus on this. When we think about inspired air, we look at that VO2, the green arrow, and you notice the lungs, the oxygen's coming in. When I look at my pulmonary arteries, they're bluish in color, but notice how it fades to red as we go through the lungs because that's going to allow that oxygenation to occur. What's wonderful is that oxygenated blood goes to the left side of the heart, so the green arrow is on top of that gear. And what you notice then is, is then you pump from the left side of the heart out to the systemic arteries, which now are red because that's the oxygenated blood going to the tissue. Now you could label that last gear brain, kidneys, any tissue you want, but Dr. Wasserman was trying to focus on exercise. And when you focus on exercise, you think about bringing oxygen to the muscle so that it can be taken up by the mitochondria so you can perform aerobic metabolism, which then allows you the production of ATP, which allows you then to run, jump, and play. But a byproduct of aerobic metabolism is CO2, which comes back by way of the veins to the right side of the heart, where that deoxygenated blood is going to go into that pulmonary arteries, but then you see that blue or turquoise arrow showing the CO2 is leaving. So I always just like to just show the gears. You have to understand they have to work together. So what you need is, is at rest right now, when you think of oxygen consumption, you need to deliver 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram body weight per minute, or what is equivalent to what is called one net. Then you will produce that CO2, and the CO2 again will be exhaled. When you are hanging out at rest, you deliver more oxygen to the tissue than you release CO2. And when you look at what is called the respiratory exchange ratio, the volume of CO2 produced versus the amount of oxygen coming in, it's less than one. And that's just nice, normal, everything is A-OK. -okay. But a problem that we're going to see with people that have survived COVID and COVID-19 and, again, have at this point damaged lungs, limited oxygen carrying capability, you and I can walk at two and a half miles an hour with no problem whatsoever. And with you and I, if we did walk at two and a half miles an hour, that's a three met activity. And in you and I, we would be delivering 3.5 milliliters of oxygen, or I'm sorry, we would be delivering 10.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram body weight or a three met activity. And what will happen though in the person that is deconditioned they probably will not be able to deliver this 10.5. And they will most likely be producing more CO2. So even when they're doing this low level activity, they could be pushing themselves beyond their anaerobic threshold. And so that is represented by the respiratory exchange ratio being greater than one, an explanation of why they're huffing and puffing. I'm gonna zoom again in right here because this is the critical place where this disease manifests itself, especially in the hospital and ICU settings. So the coronavirus, the basic structure is it's got these spike glycoproteins. So if you look off at the left, there is that coronavirus the corona is these spike proteins that are occurring. 
what I'm showing you here at the bottom, that's your type 1 pneumocyte. And what we've got here is over on this side, that virus is being engulfed, brought into the type 1 pneumocytes. Again, feel free to hyperlink to any of these um, articles that you see down at the bottom. And the thing that I want to explain is, why does it get into the respiratory system? Because it has an ACE2 type of receptor. So what you notice here on the left-hand side where the arrow is, is that if this is a type 1 pneumocyte, that coronavirus gets in by endocytosis because there is a receptor called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 that again is on the surface of these cells and allows this virus to get into the type 1 pneumocytes. What happens with viruses that you have to realize is they're not actually even living creatures. They get into you and they take over your cell's machinery and what they do is translate and produce more of themselves so that then you produce them inside of your body. Then you cough and you give it to somebody else or even speak to them and you can give them this virus. But one thing I want to point out right now is, is when you have virally infected cells, your body does react to it. And your body's immune system is going to kick in and form different types of immune cells to try to handle this. We're going to have antibodies. We're going to have T killer cells. There are multiple different immune mechanisms to try to destroy virally infected cells. The typical clinical presentation of COVID-19 is this. If you look on the right, it's fever and headache. It's hemoptysis, which is coughing blood. You can have a cough, you get muscle aches, myalgias, you can have diarrhea, you can have renal failure, septic shock, and again, the one I'm gonna focus on is pneumonia, which will lead to dyspnea or shortness of breath. So with the COVID-19 clinical manifestations, you gotta understand most people are gonna have mild types of manifestations. This is most common. So absent to mild pneumonia, these people are up, they're walking around, they don't know they have the problem. If symptoms are present, it's consistent with an upper respiratory infection, usually without shortness of breath. These individuals are walking amongst us and spreading this virus. That's why we're doing social distancing right now. With people that have moderate, they're gonna have cough and a little bit and some shortness of breath, but usually no signs of severe pneumonia. They will not typically even have a uh, fever. And that's why when all that testing was done, let's see if they, people have it by checking for fever, many, many people can have it. And you can see down here, mild to moderate disease accounts for about 80% of the cases don't even have a fever and yet they're giving it to one another. Whereas the people that you're seeing in the hospital, this is severe to critical. So severe is about 13.8% of the cases. They'll have severe dyspnea, more than 30 breaths per minute. They'll be hypoxic, so blood oxygen levels oftentimes are less than 93. Again, we typically think of 90 or below is going to imply they do have hypoxia. But again, the cutoff here can be 93. They're gonna have a PaO2, which is the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood versus the FiO2, what is the oxygen in the air they're breathing, of less than 300. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit more in depth just to make sure you understand it. 
They'll have lung infiltrates over more than 50% of their lung fields. And I'm going to show you some radiographs that show this. Fever is typical, though afibril presentations are possible. When it moves into critical, this is 6.1% of the cases. This is where we're going to see acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is ARDS. These people can go into septic shock and have multi-organ failure. And sadly, these are the people that are likely to die. So just to show you here a difference on radiograph between a normal lung, which we see on the left, you can see the diaphragm down below. You can see the heart shadow there. You can see the x-rays pass through the lungs, through the gas, and it's a nice dark area in the lung fields. But if you look off on the right, what you notice here is, is you see the following. You see down here an infiltrate where on the other side you see how it's dark. Here you see all this white material, which represents cellular and fluid infiltrate into the area. You see it here on the left side as well because of the heart shadow. We know we're on the left side over here. And basically you see an obliteration of the diaphragm. All of that infiltrate that you're looking at here represents in this individual pneumonia. Here it is, just a lateral view. And so again, normal is on the left, but what we have is on the right, you can see again this area, all this white patchy infiltrate, both in this anterior as well as posterior, and complete basically obliteration of where the diaphragm was. Comorbidities and complications. Common comorbidities of patients with COVID-19 include diabetes, coronary artery disease, and obesity. Now I put advanced age in here in parentheses for the following reason. That is not a comorbidity, but with advanced age, you're more likely to see people with diabetes with coronary artery disease. One thing I'm going to point out, but again, this is not the critical thing for most of the patients that you're seeing, is there's also vascular inflammation with COVID-19. That can lead to myocarditis, inflammation of the heart tissue, which also can lead to dysrhythmias in the heart, irregular rhythms. But the focus, again, is on ARDS. So, here is what the split nice figure shown off on the right hand side that you can see is there's the normal alveolus on the left hand side on the right hand side is the injured alveolus during the acute phase so what's going to happen is alveolar epithelial damage is going to lead to capillary damage and what's going to happen is cells are going to leave the capillary and move fluid and cells into this alveolus. So what I'm going to point out is this. You see right here, you see the necrotic or ap apoptotic type 1 pneumocyte. Necrotic means it's dead. Apoptotic basically means is the, shell, the cell itself is breaking into pieces, trying to survive, but usually it's going to die no matter what. We see right here, there is a basement membrane, which you see on the normal, as well as here on this diseased alveoli. And that basement membrane is going to be very, very important, as you're going to see in just a little bit. What we also have here is hyaline membrane. Hyaline membrane is pink protonaceous material that is filling up inside of this alveolus. What we then have is up. Do, do, do. Oop. 
you can see, I'm sorry, I missed the arrow, but it's the one where you can see on the inside, it's the red arrow on the left, you can see the cellular infiltrate, um, you can see an activated neutrophil, releasing leukotrienes, platelet activating factor, proteases dissolving protein, all of that is shown right there as well. But the one thing where you see the thickened red arrow coming in from the right-hand side, you see an intact type 2 pneumocyte. Remember, those are the pneumocytes that, again, can produce surfactant. Whereas here, you're looking at the capillary. The capillary in areas where you have non-functional alveoli get typically reduced blood flow to the point where they get damaged. You can see white blood cells are leaking out of this capillary. Platelets can begin to stick in this area. So what's happening here is this damaged capillary is leaking out material, these separation of the endothelial cells. What's happening is you're getting this inflammatory exudate going into the interstitial area and then flowing into the alveoli. So the one thing that they have shown is when it comes to ARDS, the severity classification is defined by the PaO2 divided by FiO2. Mild ARDS, which is shown here, is going to be this PaO2 divided by FiO2 of somewhere between 200 and 300. And I'm going to explain that in just a little bit more detail in a minute. Moderate is when it's between 100 and 200, and severe is when it's less than 100. Those clinical trials are what you're seeing here for the above, but for more information on what this is all about, please go to the second hyperlink that you see there. So just to make sure we're all on the same page with this, PaO2 stands for the partial pressure of oxygen in your arterial blood. FiO2 is the amount or percentage of oxygen that you are breathing in. So I'm giving two examples right here. The one at the top is a normal person. The partial pressure will be about 98 millimeters of mercury. The typical percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere at sea level is around 21%. So the ratio of this is 466, which again is well above what we saw for even mild ARDS. But please, people will be coming into the emergency room and if they are not on oxygen, their PaO2 might be at 40 millimeters of mercury. They're breathing again room air and now you look at that PaO2 over FiO2, and now we're at 190. This will put you into that moderate category. So I know this is going back a little bit, but the old oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve points this out so beautifully what I've just been talking about, and that is this. If I look off on the vertical axis on the left, I'm looking at hemoglobin saturation, or what we commonly call O2 sat. On the right-hand side, you're looking at the amount of oxygen carried per 100 mLs of blood. What I wanna make sure you realize is down at the bottom is your PaO2. And so what I want to show you is that red circle there is the normal person that I just talked about whose PaO2 is 98, their O2 sat is 99%, they're happy, they're doing great, life is good. But the person over on the right whose PaO2 is 40 they might come in with an O2 sat in the upper 70s, and they're carrying a whole lot less oxygen with them. So PaO2 over FiO2 examples using inspired supplemental oxygen. So you might have a patient with a 
PaO2 of 85 millimeters of mercury and an 80% supplemental oxygen. And what you're going to see is they could be at moderate ARDS because they're above 100. But with a PaO2 of 40 and they're on 100% pure oxygen, they're now down at that PaO2 over FiO2 of 40, which is severe ARDS. ICU level of care. It's required in about 20 to 25 percent of the individuals hospitalized with COVID-19. Occurs in the setting of hypoxemia given respiratory failure, thereby requiring mechanical ventilation. And the most common sequelae of what's going on once they get to the ICU is ARDS is the big one. Kidneys, the body goes like this. Not a vital organ, shut off blood flow to it which then can actually lead to kidney injury and actually big problems with the kidneys, but also cardiac injury and liver dysfunction. But the big one, again, is ARDS. Pulmonary impact post-infection. So mild cases, and we're talking about the people that come into the hospital. So I'm not talking about the people that are out there that had a mild case and nothing really occurred with them. I'm talking about the people that come into the hospital, but now they are post-infection. Often they're gonna have a ground glass opacity up to 26 days following the infection in their lungs. What is this ground glass opacity? Well, basically what that represents is slow reabsorption of the consolidation that was occurring in the alveoli. It can also represent interstitial thickening and fibrosis within the lung. Severe cases post-infection, right at the moment, it's too early to tell if long-term sequelae will differ, and that is occurring from the ARDS precipitated by other causes. Impact may be greater given the unique considerations associated with inpatient care with patients with COVID-19, whereby best practices established to mitigate risk of impairments fail to occur with regularity because potentially lack of equipment to get therapists in there to work with these patients. And oftentimes they are sedated to the point where you're really not able to do that much to them. ARDS of non-COVID origin has been associated with long-term impairments of lung function, physical function, strength, and emotional well-being. There's increased likelihood of developing future heart disease, kidney disease, and stroke. So my little diagram right here shows again a nice normal alveolus. And what I'm going to try to do is explain why some people, when they heal, some people can regenerate normal lung tissue and some people will not. So what I'm looking at here is a nice normal alveolus. You see the type 1 pneumocytes, the flattened cells that are over there. You see the type 2 pneumocytes with, again, the surfactant within them. So the one thing that we've got right here is there's your type 1, there's your type 2. But a big thing is there's the old alveolar macrophage looking for foreign material. But what we have right here is a basement membrane surrounding the alveoli and the capillaries. You see one over here on the left, one over on the right. Now, when you inhale this spiky virus, and it gets into your lungs, the problem is going to be is not only does it get into your alveolar macrophage because that's looking for something foreign, but what's going to happen now is, is it's also going to get into your type 1 pneumocytes. So you see it beginning to collect inside of the type 1 pneumocytes. As it collects and takes over the machinery, it starts to produce more virus, but eventually kills them. And that's why I'm putting these X's over the type 1 pneumocytes. 
the way you can heal from this and get what is called regeneration of lung tissue to be normal and functional is, is the cells that regenerate first are the type 2 pneumocytes. Over time, those type 2 pneumocytes will flatten, become type 1 pneumocytes, and guess what? You can then regenerate nice, normal lung alveoli. But if the destruction of these alveoli is massive enough and you destroy the basement membrane, these daughter type 2 pneumocytes don't know where to grow. And in that case there, what's going to happen is, is that can lead to fibrosis. So the problem with extensive necrosis of these alve alveoli is the basement membrane is destroyed. Type 2 pneumocytes do not know where to regenerate. The lungs heal by fibrotic scarring, and the scar tissue does not allow for gas exchange. You have to have alveoli and nice, competent capillaries. This can lead to a long-term deficit in oxygenation. So the World Health Organization China report that came out basically shows this. Mild to moderate is the grand majority of people. But please realize a subset of the mild can go on all the way to death. A subset of the moderate can go on to death, but certainly more likely severe and critical are going to lead to death. But again, the big point with this is, is people are walking around with this virus. They're not wearing masks and they're talking to you and you can get this virus. So the pathophysiology of the coronavirus main concepts, coronavirus binds to ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme to receptors. This leads to a clinical pneumonia. One of the things they have observed is that seems to lead to death is when those inflammatory cells that get into the alveoli lead to a cytokine storm. That can often lead to, again, death in these individuals. Our immune system is wonderful to a certain extent, but sometimes it can actually overreact and cause problems. Alveolar damage occurs. With excessive pulmonary edema, this alveolar damage can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then healing is dependent on the amount of lung damage. Do we get regeneration, which would be the ideal thing to occur, versus repair? If they get repair, that's going to lead to long-term deficits in capabilities to bring oxygen in. I am ever the optimist. You all are the unsung heroes. I love this quote from Winston Churchill. Success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. That is just such a wonderful statement. Don't lose your enthusiasm. I really also want to thank Angela Campbell, the president of the cardiovascular and pulmonary section, for asking myself, Dr. Stewart, and Dr. Rubel to get involved with this. We really felt it was important to get it out to you last week. We're getting it out to you as quick as we can. References, I listed them at the beginning, and I put so many nice hyperlinks in that can help you. Please feel free to go to all that. This is just sort of a primer on this to help you understand what is going on and the big problem with this coronavirus and COVID-19. I can never do any teaching without showing a picture of my wife and I. This is, oh, several years ago when we were biking through Champagne. It's probably my favorite picture of Linda and I, because yes, we're drinking a little Champagne. I'm wearing a Rolling Stones bike shirt. She's smiling, probably told her a joke. She hates this picture because she thinks I'm throwing or somebody has thrown a dart in her back.
but I disagree. I think it's beautiful. Take care. Thank you so much for this opportunity.